The great touch of you. Yeah. That's nice. (laughs) I like that. Yeah, that's well done. I think that I think that gets the point at home immediately, doesn't it? You know, for even if you don't look into any of the mathematics, at least you know immediately what we're talking about, right? <laughs> Have you heard Gavin and I've talked about it a few times where we talk about how they 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 had a the great switcheroo, which is where they switched us from realizing that we looked at a Euclidean world through spherical eyes into believing that we look at a spherical world through Euclidean eyes. They flipped it right around. Yeah, I think, well, according to history, I think it was the Greeks who did that. That's how the history oh. we're told, at least. Yeah, we, we think it's a bit late. We think it was Gauss and Riemann. Who yep. A lot more <laughs> recent. I'm pretty they, sure it was around right about those times as well, yeah. At least formally, the way they've done it. I mean, the, for me, the mathematics works the same. If you're on a round ball and you tell everybody that they have planar vision, i.e. what they would normally call perspective representation, then the geometry of everything that you see and all the appearances is the same as if you were on a flat plane, but you had globular vision, spherical vision. So spherical vision on a flat plane is the same as planar vision on a spherical surface. So it's just switch round, if you like, yeah. And, you know, I think the person who discovered it was a guy called Thomas Reed, um, who you probably heard me talking about. He was a polymath in Scotland, who was the first person to write about the geometry of visibles. Um, and the first, or probably one of the first to make the distinction between tangible geometry and visible geometry. And he wrote, quite extent well not quite extensively did some experiments which i think are great um and wrote about it and basically defined 10 or 12 axioms without going through any of the further mathematics and it's exactly the same axioms that riemann used 70 years later to define his you know um, or what gauss and riemann both used to define the the, the curvature of the earth um and the you know, the, the valid mathematical geometry that we have now that Einstein went on to use and, you know, all the bullshit. So this guy, I think, about 70 years before Riemann, so about 1750, was the first guy to really, you know, dive into it in any detail. And I'm pretty sure that he got sidelined and sidetracked and the people saw what he'd done and reused his mathematics to, to make the deception work properly. I'm not saying there wasn't deception before that. You know, I'm pretty sure there was, but I think that was the big turning point, at so least as far as I can search. Well, I know they started. Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that's where they basically came into this whole paradigm now where they've got mathematical proofs for everything. I think the eye works and why, why it's correct to use the circular arc because our eye is globular and the back of the retina is a curved surface so that what's happening at the back of my eye and my retina can be represented by an arc in front of my eye, which is why I've set up these geometric diagrams that way. And then there's basically, you know, the the planar angle that you need. um, and, And there's basically only two theorems that you need to know. Um, to understand direct vision. And uh, direct vision, the theory of direct vision, I think is different from the theory of perspective. Perspective for me is representing 3D objects on a 2D planar surface by mathematical rules. Whereas the theory of direct vision is applied to how your eye works. It's, you know, geometrical optics rather than, than, than paintings or drawings, yeah, or technical drawings. Um, and there's only two theorems that you really need to know, and, and that is that objects have that proportion respectively as the angles under which they are seen. Um, and I've got geometrical proofs in here, right? So I went through all the diagrams, did all the proofs, um, and also show in here you know, certain things that people take for granted, but they shouldn't take for granted. So things, it's not as simple as saying, if something's twice as far away, then it's going to be half the size. You know, that's what ballers tell us, right? Yeah. But 
it's actually a lot more complicated than that, depending on the situation of your eye and how the object is, yeah? Maybe if I just run briefly, at least before we dive into any more detail about a little bit the, the history of how I got to it, right? Um, you know, I think the major thing was this differentiation between visibles and tangibles. <clears throat> and I don't know if you guys have heard me saying this on, on Dells before, but the very fact that we do not attend to visible figure is one of the biggest problems that, that we have as humans, right? Um, when I say we don't attend to visible figure, what I mean is if I ask you now what the shape of the table is in front of you, Zach, what, what, what shape is the table? Hmm. Which, which shape? Any I mean, table. <laughs> any table, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a rectangle. It's, I don't know. What was... That's the tangible shape, right? That, yeah. That you, when I ask that question, you will automatically jump to answering it and saying, yeah, that table is rectangular, right? But if you look at it and you look at its visible figure, it's not a rectangle, right? No, it's kind of... It's a trapeze a or a parallelogram yeah. or... Yeah, you know. one of those. Yeah, exactly. And wherever you walk in the room, that visible figure is going to change, right? So that, Absolutely. yes, the tangible object, the physical object is a rectangular shape that doesn't change because it's substantial, but the visible figure will depend whatever on where you are in the room in relation to the object and what angle you're viewing from it. So that table is always changing shape, right? But yeah. you, you will never attend to that. You know, you will not direct your attention or what the philosophers call today intentionality, which is a word I fucking hate, but um, uh, you, you will not direct your attention to it in such a way that you actually see what you're actually seeing, what your eyes are seeing. You're, you're jumping immediately to, to what you know it represents in your head. As Reed said, you don't see the signs, you automatically go to the things signified by them. And that was, for me, a major kind of clue and understanding that Yes, we look at things all the time, but we actually don't see its visible shape and extension, right? And that there is a real differentiation between tangible objects and visible objects, which at the end of the day, we shorten down to tangibles and visibles, right? So a visible object is, is something that we can contemplate, we can study, we can mathematically look at, we can all experience and observe them if we uh, direct our attention to it yes so it is an object of thought the same way a physical object is also something that we can think about build construct right um and that these two things are separate things and they need to be treated separately and that the tangible object is very much euclidean planar geometry that's what the whole world is constructed on levels and, and, and perpendiculars and parallels but visible object is not it actually obeys the rules of spherical geometry now you might or we'll all find that in, in the first instance a little bit tricky to understand because you'll say but i don't see things curved gavin right and and the explanation of that is that if you're at the center of that sphere looking out then of course you will not see the outward curves of the sphere so when you're looking at something, you'll see it as a straight line. But that doesn't mean that the geometry of visual perception is not spherical. Just because it looks Euclidean, it's not. It's actually spherical, right? And because we direct our attention to things, we're always looking straight on at stuff. And it appears to be Euclidean because you will never see the outward curve of your own eye, right? You will always see the same way that if I, you know, put something like this, it looks like a line, right? And you, you don't see that it's a plane, right? It's, the similar, it's a similar problem, yeah? So we don't attend to visible figure, and we don't realize that it's spherical in nature and not planar the way they tell it it is because they confuse the definitions of perspective and, you know, they, give, they have us looking at flat screens all our life, uh, you know, and so, so we tend to think everything's just planar. So that, that's the first thing that I think that differentiation between visibles and tangibles was a key eye opener for me. Um, and you know, another question that, that, that kind of fortifies what I'm saying, if I ask you, 
uh, have you ever experienced double vision? Yes. When you were drunk or when you knocked your head? Um, when I was drunk a couple of times, but my eyes, if I'm thinking about something really intensely and my mind starts to wander, I'll notice when I come back that my eyes are kind of crossed and I'm seeing mm -hmm. two of everything. Yeah. So yeah, now it, it happens was, to me quite a bit. <laughs> if I was to tell, ask you to put your finger out in front of your hand, mm -hmm. out in front of your eyes, and look at your finger, and attend to what's behind your finger, tell me how many heads you see of me. Wow, yeah. And I if you look at my head, if, I now see two of my fingers. My head, yeah. yeah, if you look at my head, you'll see two of my fingers. So the, the actual reality of the thing is, is we see double all the time. We, again, we just don't attend to it. We throw away that piece of information, if you like, so that what the eye is actually doing at any one given instant is a lot more different than we think it's doing because we jump automatically to the things that we think are signified by them and we don't actually see the visible signs, right? So that's kind of like two examples of, of, you know, when you realize that, that there is a real difference, then you can actually start to study them as different. But if you don't even make that distinction, which mathematicians don't do either, then you don't get anywhere looking at where the problem might lie, right? Oh, I never thought sense? of it that way. Yeah, that's... Yeah, well put, extremely well put. Very well, well put, yeah. yeah. Except for the fact that if you didn't do it that way, you'd be falling over and tripping over things all the time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, it kind of gets back to this, you know, and, and I, I don't like whatever this, you know, let's leave the creator out of this. And I, I'd, I'd prefer to call it nature, but it's just one of these things that nature gives us that is, how should I say, true. It's not self-evidently true because we don't attend to it. We don't direct our attention to it. But it's just something that's given to us, right? We come to the world this way, and it's the way it is. But nobody's really completely understood it. I, um, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm probably, we've probably discussed this before, but I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of going through this. What's going through my head at the moment is like, like I just said. Um, it's part of our constitution not to attend to it. Yes, I agree because. because because, I agree, because across the road, we yeah. have to think that the car is coming towards us. We don't sit and look and see the visible figure of the car changing as it's coming towards us. We right. jump immediately to get out the fucking way or you're going to be hit, right? Yeah, so, so yes, it's, it's necessary for our survival, I think, yeah. is what you're saying, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it's sort of like, okay, they've played on that. The, the, the powers that be have played on the fact that our constitution puts that out of our mind yep. and, and, and they make sure it stays out of our mind. Because if you come back and do attend to it, you can work out what's going on. Whereas in day-to-day -day living, you're best not to attend to those things. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think the, the next thing that for me was, was important to understand was the, the planar, and and spherical geometry so if i if i draw you know two lines here on a plane then the mathematical relationship if this was a triangle that these angles all add up to 180 degree, to degrees will not change irrespective of where i put this plane in any direction the properties of that triangle will never change a plane is a plane in any situation, in any orientation, inclination, it doesn't matter. The properties of something on a plane never change irrespective of its orientation in 3D space, right? Those angles will never change. But that is not the case for a sphere. There's no such concept, for example, of similar triangles. So I think you guys all know what a similar triangle is, right? If I, you know, I'm drawing this very hurriedly and badly, but a, a similar triangle is that if I scale it up, then it's always still going to be 180 degrees and the proportion of the sides to each other 
or the angles to each other is always going to stay in the same relation. Yeah. And that doesn't matter how big my plane is. But that's not the case in a sphere. If I, have, if, I, if I draw a little triangle on a balloon and I blow up the balloon, then the angles of that spherical triangle on that balloon are going to get bigger and bigger. They can go all the way up to 720 degrees, right, on, on, on a sphere. And if any two triangles are, well, there's no concept of similarity. There's only congruity. So if, 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 if a tr spherical triangle has the same angle size, then it's the same triangle. It's, it's not like a plane where it could be a small one or a big one or a, yeah? It only is that one spherical triangle and it has to be on a certain size on a sphere to be that triangle. There is no such concept of similarity on a, on a sphere, yeah? The same way that I, I showed it as a plane. So that, and, and a one key concept in mathematics is also the difference between a sphere and a ball. To qualify that in geom geometry, a sphere is only the surface of the sphere <coughs> and not the substance inside the sphere. Whereas a ball is the surface and all the stuff in between. But uh, okay. uh, I call it a two sphere and a three ball because a sphere is a two dimensional object embedded in a three dimensional space that you're supposed to believe is possible. Whereas a three ball is a three dimensional ball, like a bowling ball or what they tell us the earth is in a vacuum. But a two sphere or any sphere, a mathematical sphere, when they talk about spheres, it's a two dimensional object, which is only talking about the surface of the object. And you're supposed to imagine, as a mathematician, that that is possible, that you can have a curved surface, but you don't need to worry about the space that it's curving into, right? You're mathematically looking at that object as a two-dimensional surface and the properties of that surface, but don't worry about the fact that in reality, it would need to curve into something. That, that it gets thrown out the window in two in spherical mathematics, yeah? Now, it's a powerful concept to use for a lot of different applications. For example, in navigation, right? Where things then simplify when you can use spherical triangles to basically find out where you are because an observation of the stars and somewhere on Earth, a flat plane, you can basically reduce your problem to finding out where you are on this flat plane by solving an astronomical spherical triangle at a given instant in time. So that's why it was very powerful in the old days in navigation when they were talking about the celestial sphere. And it's also powerful in a lot of other ways. So, you know, mathematically, it is an object that, yes, you can think about and it's useful. But what they like to do is confuse the sphere, the two sphere and the three ball. So a layman will not understand that difference. And anything that they say about spherical mathematics, they automatically assume means a three-dimensional ball. So that's also a very important distinction, right? Another I think we did a couple of videos on that, Glenn, as well. Hold on yeah, one should, we probably should go through and pull out the bits and pieces of those videos so that, the, that Chris and Zach can have a look at them. Yeah. Actually, you, I'll do that. I'll go through and I'll, I'll edit them a bit. That's fine. I don't know if you have them at hand at the moment. If, if you think there's something we should show immediately. I haven't got them at hand at the moment, actually. Uh, oh, actually, I've just got our hangouts, but I wouldn't know which ones to go to. Okay. No, probably better off doing it the way you're doing it at the moment. I can, see that, I can see that the boys are gobsmacked. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it makes yeah. so much sense. So let, so let me just, just to go into that slightly in more detail, I, I don't want to, to detract from what we're saying, but it is an important distinction. Let me share my screen. Um, this one. So can you guys see that? Yep. yep. Yeah. So this is a, a sphere or a ball, right? Because both the representations of both of these things would be the same, 
right? There's no way to visually show a sphere that doesn't look like a ball, right? And if I show you a ball, it's going to be exactly the same as showing you a mathematical sphere, even though one mathematically is treated as two-dimensional and the other one's a three-dimensional ball, right? There's no way to do it. I wouldn't know how. And they know that, right? <laughs> so, but just to, to, to make it very clear, so a sphere is always only concerned about the surface and never about the points in the middle. There is no center, if you like, to a sphere. It doesn't, be, or put it this way, it doesn't belong to the sphere, right? It's only the surface that counts. And the way they measure the radius or the diameter of a sphere is you have to stay on the surface. With a ball, you can go right through the middle and say that's the diameter of the sphere. But on a math, on a, oh, sorry, the diameter of a ball. But on a mathematical sphere, you can't go through the middle because the middle doesn't belong to the sphere and it's not on the surface. So they define, mathematicians define the diameter as going from one point on the equatorial circle up over the North Pole and down the other side. That is the definition of a diameter on a sphere and not what you would intuitively think to go right through the middle of the ball because you're not allowed to. I did not know that. It's, it also has one implication that's quite interesting. Um, do you think pi is a constant? That's what they tell us, but... <laughs> In planar geometry, it is, right? In planar geometry, if I draw a circle on... Yeah? If I draw a circle here, then it doesn't matter what size that circle will be. The, the ratio of the circumference to the diameter will always be pi. That's the definition of pi, the ratio of the length of the circumference to the length of a diameter is pi. But if you go back to the sphere here, then you will see that it's not the case because what I've drawn here is one diameter of this sphere. And you can see that that's half of a great circle. A great circle would go all the way around and back round to the bottom again which means that the circumference divided by the diameter here is Ooh. two. Yeah. <laughs> so pi is not a constant in spherical geometry. It's only a constant in planar geometry. Wow. So what is, so, so, <laughs> sorry? It's mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. Why I they, I can't believe they didn't teach me that in geometry. No, uh, they like to they like to keep these things away. Um, I think I actually mentioned it here. Yeah, so you can. This is where it says here. Yeah, yeah. So for different circles of latitude, your spherical pi will change. So for example, if I take this circle up here, right, this latitude circle, and I want to know the diameter of that circle then the diameter is from the point K up over the North Pole down to J, right? That is the diameter of that circle of latitude on the sphere. And that works out to have an even different, you know, in this case, it's 2.84, right? So it's constantly changing, always. It's depending. constantly changing, yes. The, it's constantly changing depending on your circle of latitude, pi constantly changes on the sphere. <laughs> Oh, that's something, something that is very relevant <laughs> to the measurements yeah. that get made, right? Yeah, huge. <laughs> okay, um, the other thing that, you know, I thought was important, so that, that, that's that distinction, making sure that a two-sphere and a three-ball are not allowed to be confused, and that mathematically there's a different way of manipulating the properties of a sphere that there is to a ball. But, and this is the important point, they also have many, many, many similarities, which you can see as kind of obvious, right? Not only, can I only, not only can I not just represent them the same way, they always look the same, but they also share many geometrical properties. Because the surface, if you like, is part of the ball, yeah? It's just that we're not allowed to talk about the center point 
on a sphere. But we do want to talk about the center point <laughs> because if we're talking about the eye, then, then it's highly relevant, yeah? So you can see that these two things have very, very many properties in common, which makes it easy for them to jump between the two without anybody noticing it, including mathematicians. But there are certain things that are, yeah, that, that you can't just um, um, assume. And that's, what, that's where they play on the sophistry, if you ask me. Yeah, so, so that was an important point. I think the third important point, I think, is this. Um, I actually had one video. So this idea that, so I, I want to, when we look at these um, diagrams later on, or we go through the document, and I introduce this arc as the way of measuring the angles, then I want to have a justification why I'm using that arc, yeah? And the justification is not just rooted in the fact that my eyeball is, is a sphere. That might be enough for some people, right? And it's fairly intuitively good, I think, that that's a kind of common sense thing that, yes, you know, uh, most people will agree on. But mathematically, there's also a very important point that <clears throat> because of these similarities between a sphere and a ball, the angle subtended, I'm trying, I need to do a, a let me find two pens, it might be better. So the angle subtended at the eye, when I look at something, this is what they call a planar angle. If I put this back onto a plane, then that planar angle will not change any way I, I do things again, right? The planar angle stays the same. But the solid, the solid angle, so if I now have two planes, if I have two planes meeting each other, then the angle in between these two planes is what they call the solid angle, right? So a planar angle, the one that I just drew with it, or the one that I was doing here with my two pens, sorry, my props are not very good today, but <laughs> with my two pens and the two planes coming together are basically the same angle. And because that, is, that holds true geometrically, it means that the angle measured at the center of the sphere or the ball can be measured, that angle, if I extend that out into a sphere, then that angle can be measured by the magnitude of this arc segment on the surface of a sphere. So if I was to make this angle bigger, um, how do I do this here, bigger or smaller, then the arc segment on a sphere is the measure of that internal angle at the center. Now that's a mathem mathematical fact. I've also got a little proof of that for people who want to dive in more deeply. But basically, I have, there's a justification for me saying, okay, this angle subtended at the eye we can measure it according to the length of the arc segment on a sphere. And the sphere can be any size because the arc segment is always going to be a measure of that angle. The further out I go, it doesn't matter. In relation to the total degrees of 360, that arc segment length is always going to be proportional to whatever angle I'm measuring as well. Right? So yep. geometrically, because a planar angle and a solid angle subtended at the center are equivalent, and because from Euclidean geometry about balls, you know, like a real solid ball, if you cut a melon, you know, and let, let's say you take a, a cut out of a melon, right? Or, or an apple or whatever, then the measure of that solid angle is the gap that you've left on the surface of that watermelon, right? It's a known fact. And it also works, it also holds with the sphere. It's, so represent, that, it's representational, isn't it? It's like they're, they're proportional representations. One's an angular proportion and one's an arc, arc segment proportion. Yeah. It's going to be a, pro, the, the arc length is going to be a proportion of the circum, circumference. And it's yep. always going to be equal to that same angular proportion. 
that's right. And it's, and in astronomy, they call it angular distance, right? Or angular size. You know, they, they like to confuse the terms and terminology of what it actually is. But that's basically what's happening. The angle at the center at your eye or at the observational instrument is being measured on the arc, the, 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 the segment of, of an arc segment of, the, of a great circle of a sphere. So where do radians come into play? Is that just another way to confuse us? Yeah, it is. It's a, that's a good point. So radians, I've actually got a, hold on, let me just bring we, it up. We got it. That's, I asked the same question when Gavin and I first discussed that. <laughs> I, ended, I ended up finding a really good video on YouTube describing how radians work. Um, yeah, because I've had to do some calculations with them, and it just it never made sense to me. It's like, why don't you just use the angle? Why do you have to have all these different? Well, radians is to do with with proportions of pi, isn't it? That's right. Yep, absolutely. Sine, correct. cosine. Yeah. Well, proportions of pi is what radians all work out to. It's um. Yep. So it's based on a ball, then, right? On a circle. <coughs> Um, you know, looking at all this stuff here, it's, it's uh, just like looking, I think they use the same stuff in geodetic surveying to come up with their, uh, with their uh, different or their state plane coordinate system. Well, yeah. isn't it true they use star measurements as well in their calculations? Yeah, what Gavin's been going through on all this different stuff here, that's what I've been thinking about, is it, this is how they've tricked people, surveyors, into believing that they're actually measuring a ball. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Exactly the same thing, yep. And I think you've been attacking it from that same angle as well, Chris, right? You know, yeah. and we all know that in all these different things in astronomy and geodetic surveying where, where we know they're lying to us because water can't bend, it's that simple, then there has to be a simple way that they've tricked everybody because we're not all fucking stupid, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it has to have something to do with, or at least from me, my point, it has to be something to do with we don't quite understand how the eye works and how our mind does not attend to the things properly. And some mathematical sophistry and manipulation of things like spherical geometry and two spheres and three balls is the way that they've done it. I mean, these are for me the kind of major components of the deception. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's how they fooled the academics like you. You know, that's how they absolutely. were able to pull it off. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. For common people, it wasn't as hard. They didn't have to, but for people who actually went into the field of study, they had to have a way to actually trick and them as well. One of the interesting aspects that Gab's come up with too is the explanation of how it was actually done, how Gauss and Riemann basically reinstituted Reed's thinking, but changed it to use it in this deception. And it looks like it was deliberate too, doesn't it? Yeah, I'd say it was deliberate. So Thomas Reed, uh, my favorite guy, right? Um, and I think I've said this before that, you know, he, was, he wasn't just a natural philosopher. He was also a mathematician. So, you know, if I compare him with people like Berkeley or Kant or Hume, then he's got that extra expertise that they don't have. Yeah. And he was the one that basically said, yes, if we think about how our eye works, and we define certain things like the horizontal plane, yeah, and how we see straight lines, even though they're curved outwards, but we don't see the curve, then he formulated basic, some very basic axioms of, of spherical geometry, basically of vision, that are identical to the same ones that Bernhard Riemann, Riemannian geometry used 70 years later, to basically say that, we can have a manifold, it's called a manifold now, which does not have to be orientable. So it can be, <laughs> which is also where the trick is into believing you can be upside down, right? Because that I think has to do with the fact that images are inverted on your retina. And there's a big philosophical discussion about that, which we shouldn't go into right now. But the main thing is that Thomas Reed 
identified that the geometry of vision was spherical geometry, and the same geometry was then used by Bernhard Riemann, who was the protege of Gauss, to, to basically change the mathematics or, or, or to separate mathematics from physics in that mathematicians were allowed to think about abstract things like two spheres, whereas physics had to contend with, okay, the mathematicians tell me that, I'll think about the motion of these objects. So they separated position from motion. And in doing that, mathematicians don't know anything about physics. Physics doesn't know anything about the mathematics. And basically what Riemann did, I think, was the geometry of visual, visual perception was misused to, to bring that deception about and compartmentalize people. Now, yeah. I, I'm just saying that because you brought it up, Glenn. That, that, that's probably a whole topic on itself again, yeah? So, yeah, I, I probably shouldn't have brought it in just now. It's just that because you were talking about that actual area and I thought, um, yeah, I, I probably piped up when I shouldn't have. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm, 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 I'm kind of asking, should I go further down that line? You know, you guys tell me, more interests, right? I don't want to, because we, we could go on for days. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I understand the, what you're saying, but yeah, whatever you, whatever you want to talk about, Kev, I'm, this is awesome. I'm... Then maybe the best thing is just to go into that document that I sent around and we can maybe just kind of step through it together. Does that make most yeah. more sense yeah have you finished did, did i interrupt too soon have you finished what you were you you, you had a, some things that you wanted to bring up before we went in there have you, um, have you got through all that yeah i think so i think the the three points so i think you know we don't attend to stuff we'd have to differentiate between tangibles and visibles and there's also then a difference between tangible geometry and visible geometry that's the first point. The second point is understanding this two sphere, three ball confusion in mathematics in that these mathematical objects are very, very similar, but you have to understand the distinction between one and the other. One is only the surface and the other one is a real solid ball of substance. And this one that's only a surface is basically what Riemann did. That's the, Rima the Riem Riemannian unit sphere that is used and went on then to be used by Einstein and Minkowski and all these people to, to talk about, you know, curved space time. <laughs> uh, I can't believe I'm, I actually believed all that shit, really. Same <laughs> Embarrassing, embarrassing. But anyway. <laughs> we all believed it, didn't we? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if you like, so, so that was tying into that anyway, Glenn, that, you know, the two sphere is Riemannian, the Riemannian geometry. But I think what, what you were wanting to point out was the fact that Thomas Reed discovered this, if you like, 70 years earlier and very well, well, I mean, he didn't go into it, the mathematics in detail. He just put out some axioms up there. But when yeah. you look at these axioms and you derive, you know, the next stage of stuff from them, um, then the equations and the formulas that you come up with are exactly the same as the Riemannian ones. So, yeah. and I would think that because Reed has been confined to the dustbin of philosophy and mathematics, I would think that that was very, very intentional. That whatever Reed did, the man was obscured, his work was not studied, nobody went into it any further. And all of a sudden, you know, a couple of years later, they, they maybe had 50 years to work out how to confuse us all properly, you know? Yeah. That's, it might be the case. I, I'm conjecturing a little bit, and I don't want to be conspiratorial necessarily because we usually never find any resolve if we ask those kind of questions, so. Um, yeah, so maybe just, let's just dive into that document, or um, I think that would make sense if I just share my screen again. Yeah, so this was kind of like the basis of um, of one of the first videos I did. Um, and I think in here, maybe maybe we'll just go through this very briefly then, Glenn, before we dive into the other document. Whatever you reckon, man. I, 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 I didn't really know. I was just, because I, I told you, I'd just been starting to read that, um, the book again. And I was think, sort of thinking to myself, 
when we go to discuss this, should we actually be discussing the geometry of vision first and then going to your um, your document, or is it better to do your document first and then have a look at the geometry of visibles later? Yeah. Well, to be honest, I, I didn't know. I kind of formulated a little intro, but from, from then on, I was going to just wing it. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Well, well, let's do what you were going to do then. Forget this. Go back to your 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 intro, and let's do that document. Don't, yeah, so the one, yeah, maybe there's just a couple of things in here that I wanted to point out. So, you know, I talked earlier on about this concept of of appearances, and that something is the in geometry. Any time we use the word appear, then what we really mean is the angle subtended at the eye by an object of sight. And when I say an object of sight, then I'm talking about visibles. I'm not talking about tangibles, right? Um, and there's one, there's, there's, a, there's one, there's actually a couple of experiments you can do that will show you that, that, that your vision is spherical. Um, and again, I think we've got a couple of videos on that, um, Glenn, which we should really maybe just show, but, um, if you have objects up very close to you, then you can actually see the spherical nature of your vision. But if things are kind of like 12 inches away, then, then the world starts to look very Euclidean again. It's, it, when it's up close, you can see things appearing to be spherical in certain circumstances. So I think what I want to say there is that if people don't believe that vision is spherical, um, or the visual perception is, is spherical geometry, then there are experiments that you can do to, to prove it to yourself, which I think is highly important. Because me saying thing that we have a spherical geometry of vision, but you see things Euclidean, is a kind of, for a lot of people, maybe okay. a kind of yeah. copy, okay. right? Yep. Um, so if I was, for example, to draw a spherical triangle in here, then and bring this up very close to your eye. So th this, these, these are three walls that are perpendicular to each other. Yeah. But if I bring them, if I bring these things closer to my eye, then the thing will actually start to look spherical. These lines will start to look curved. Yeah. Wow. I'm going to have to do this. Yeah. There's a scatter of, 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 um, yeah. So, that's one, of the, two. one of the things Gavin and I have been talking about doing is putting a list together of these little um, experiments and modelling them, you know, making a couple of videos to show people how to do them. Yep. Yeah, because I think that would be highly relevant to the, to the overall discussion. Yep. Um, now, there's, there's a big question about how the visibles and tangibles actually relate to each other, right? So, a visible and this is the words of Thomas Reed, and you probably heard me saying this in the introduction, we pass from the sign to the thing signified with ease and by natural impulse, but to go backward from the thing signified to the sign is a work of labor and difficulty. Visible yeah. figure being intended by nature to be a sign, we pass on immediately to the thing signified and cannot easily return to give any attention to the sign. This yeah. is from his yeah. famous book. <laughs> from his famous book, Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense. If you ask me, the best book ever written. Yeah, I agree. Wow. I've actually got it in audio format and uh, we, we actually did start doing it as a, a, um, a discussion and a PowerPoint at one stage. But we never, we kept getting dragged off onto other things. I know, it's such a wide topic, wasn't it? Yeah. So, so a visible and a tangible are both real things. They are both separate mathematical objects of thought, and they are both separate parts of reality that everybody can observe and experience. And a tangible will exist whether you look at it or not. And, you know, if, if I was up looking down through this telescope and I said to somebody else, come over here and look, They'll see the same tan they'll see the same visible that I saw. So it doesn't depend on me necessarily. So visibles are 
are related to the tangible objects. It's the tangible object, the light shining from that, that is making this visible exist. And sure, somebody needs to look at it to experience it, and they'll see the visible figure. But if I go away from that, then that object is still shining light, right? And it's only that an eye needs to get in the way to be able to see that visible. So if you like, a visible is, is a part of the tangible external world that we see, right? That exists out there. And that they do have a certain commonality to them. So there's a, there's a difference between the geometry of touch and the geometry of vision that should be clearly understood, yeah? And the main, we call these tangibles and we call these visibles. Um, and that comes actually from George Berkeley of Berkeley University, California, the Bishop of Cloyne, who was um, one of the first guys at least who clearly defined the difference between visibles and tangibles. But him and Reed were, were not of the same opinion. Um, but it's important to, to understand that Sometimes, and this is just a, a, a by the by the by, sometimes tangibles is not the correct word to use because philosophers sometimes use tangibles to, to refer to sensations that you have in the body um, rather than the way we are using it at the moment to, to, to mean physical substance, like, you know, the physical world. But I'm going to stick to the common sense way of, of thinking about it. So you have visibles and you have tangibles. So if we, if we want to measure tangible substances, then what we're doing is measuring the proportions and the intervals of these physical objects, their shape and their extension, so their shape and size, so to speak, in, in modern terminology, with respect to each other. So if I'm measuring something, then I'm doing it with a ruler, for example, and I will define a ruler to be, let's say, one foot long, and then I will go along the outside of an object with my ruler, and I will say it's 10 rulers long, i.e. it's 10 feet long, if my ruler was one foot. So, and when I measure the width of it, uh, of the object, of the physical object, then I'm also doing the same thing. I'm taking my ruler and I'm laying it along. So what I'm doing at the end of the day is I'm measuring the object, or the parts of the object, or the extension of the object, with respect to each other. So I'm relating its width and its breadth and its height using a ruler with respect to each other, with respect to the parts of the object. But when I measure visibles, then I'm always doing it with respect to the eye in a particular situation. The same way I asked you, Zach, what, what shape the table is. That depends on exactly the relationship between your eye and the table. And we can never forget that that's relative to exactly where you are and how you're looking at it. Also the inclination and the rake of your head and the, the way you look at things. And that stuff is a completely different way of measuring objects than tangible stuff is. Because one of the differences is, and this is why the geometry of vision is spherical, is that it's two-dimensional. You cannot possibly determine the distance of an object from your eye using geometry alone. You sometimes have depth cues. So, for example, you could see that something is further away because you know it's a horse and you know the size of a horse and you know you can relate to things or, or grass that's further away will be lighter than grass that's closer to you. It'll be a darker green closer to you so that you know that the grass, because it's the same color, if you were right up next to the far away grass, it would be the same color as the grass near to you. But you know that the grass is further away because the color is slightly how should I say, diffused or, unfo or, or, or lesser, a lesser intensity of green. But from a purely geometric point of view, you cannot tell whether something is very close to you and very small or very far away from you and very big. 
It's called the so-called size, distance, and variance problem. And it's the thing that astronomers have to contend with all the time. They have no way geometrically of knowing whether the star is massive, as they tell us the sun is, and it's 92 million miles away, or whether it's only 3,000 miles away and 32 miles in diameter, or in radius, uh, sorry, diameter, or whether it really is the size of a five pence coin um, held uh, at arm's length. You cannot tell the difference in those things from a geometric perspective. And that's why you cannot see the distance of things, but you, what you can do is see the position of things. And that is the, the big distinction that we have to make, that yes, with our eyes, we can see the position of certain things in relation to other things, but we cannot ever geometrically, with our eyes, see the true distance of something. Again, I'm ignoring depth cues, as they call them, of which there are a few, but when we look at the night sky, these depth cues are no longer available to us, so that when we look at the night sky, for example, we can't tell geometrically whether that star's far away or not. That's when they have to play with things like light intensity and luminosity and spectrography, all the spectro yeah, spectrography, spectrography to, to, to tell us all these fucking fairy stories because they can't do it geometrically. Is, is there a, a slight caveat to, caveat to that with stereoscopic vision for things close within, a, within arm's reach? Yes, that, that would be another cue. The fact that our eyes are slightly separated and there is a parallax, if you like, yeah? between yep. the two things, then yes, you can, if you like, focus on it. But remember my experiment with two toilet rolls? Yep. That if you put them together, then all you really see is one circle. So yep. binocular vision obeys the same rules as monocular vision um, from a geometric standpoint. Yep. But the thing to remember is that these two geometries and how you measure these two geometries are two completely different things. One of them, the top one, is our 3D Euclidean world. And the bottom one here is a two-dimensional sphere because the position of an object, if that's the only thing that you can find out, the position of the object, and you can't measure the, the distance from you, then everything appears to be the same distance. So everything appears to be on the inside surface of a sphere. Yep. At the same distance from the center point, your eye. Yep. And our eye actually makes the yeah that shape. Oh the, man, that's another that's another subject where you get into the visual accuracy and angular resolution that creates that that sphere, the distance that that sphere is away from you. So basically, if I draw the geometrical model now of a of a sphere with an eye at the center then this is the kind of, if you like, I'm, I'm now, I don't think of this as the eye anymore. Think of this as the geometrical space of visual, of visual perception with an eye at the center looking out. So what you see is basically visible figure on the inside surface of this sphere, the inside concave surface. You're in the middle, you're looking out, and your whole world of visibles everything you see, every visible object that you see is actually basically being registered as a figure on the inside concave surface of a sphere. Um, so I've talked about this before, the eye is very obviously globular. A few of these things are now in that document, so I'm kind of skipping, yeah. skipping forward a little bit. Um, yeah. So I hope that I've, I've justified to you guys that when I'm looking at how the eye behaves in situations like railway lines or lampposts or, or things going into the distance, that it is valid for me because the retina is curved and because geometrically speaking, the center of the eye is the place where the rays cross over, they get inverted, so this is where the inversion happens. On the, that's why the, the, 
uh, the object looks to be upside down on your retina, or in fact, it is upside down on your retina. There is a material impression. But the, these angles here, so this pink angle to the green angle, the proportion of that pink to that green is the same as the proportion of that green to that pink. Nothing has changed. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And that these arc segment lengths, because of what I said beforehand, this uh, planar angle and the solid angle from the center of a sphere can be measured by the, the arc length of a great circle. If I was to continue this, it's a great circle of a sphere. Then we can basically, when we're looking at the phenomena of railway tracks, for example, then we are perfectly justified to use a circle of measure rather than a tangible straight line measurement. So that's yeah. why in, in, in the, the document where I've went through the theorems, um, I can basically use this arc measure to explain what is going on. And I don't need to worry about angles, if you like. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. I've got one question, and I don't know whether it's worth, it's about the difference between an angle and a solid angle, a, a planar angle and a solid angle. Yep. What, I, I, I know from the definition that you gave, the, the way you showed it, with the, the pens and the two planes, how it works, but what is the actual, is it, is, is, where's, where, where is there any importance in, the, in a difference, in that difference? Well, I think the, the importance for me is that um, a solid angle is, is a real physical substance like a melon. And a planar angle is the angle that we can see when we measure um, or when we look at a visible object. All we see is the difference between two points, right? I mean, I don't actually see an angle. If I'm looking at two stars, then I see that they have some positional separation. But I don't yeah. see the line going from my eye the, to, to, to each of these stars, yeah? All I oh, see is that they, in my visible, that they have a different visible position in my space, and that's what I'm trying to measure. And, but the very fact that that planar angle that I'm measuring is the yep. same as the solid angle in a, in a real ball is, yep. is the geometrical connection between the two. Right, that, okay. Yep. okay. Does that help? Yep, definitely. Okay. So basically, I, I feel that you know, we are justified in using a circle of measure, as they call it. So a complete circle is 360 degrees. The arc segments are in the same proportion to each other as the angles subtended at the eye, and also as the angles subtended then on the retina. They are in proportion to each other. And that allows us to, to now have a better description of all these phenomena. Um, and one that is basically spherical geometry, the same geometry they use to confuse us. Actually, when you're yeah. measuring those arc segments, yep. are you what, what, do you, what, what do you measure them in? Well, that's where radians could come in, but then you need to be careful because pi is different on a sphere. Yep. That's why I wanted to throw that in. Or you can, in fact, measure the angle, but it all depends on what you define as, the, as your visual space and the position of these objects in your visual space. Yeah? Yeah, but you, you wouldn't go around and try and measure that in millimeters. No. No. Always in angles. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this was one of the telling things for me as well, which is why I'm quoting it here, again, from Thomas Reed, 1750, right? This guy was a fucking genius. So I, I ain't a genius, but this guy was. Um, when, the, when the geometrician draws a diagram with the most perfect accuracy, when he keeps his eye fixed upon it, and while he goes through a long process of reasoning and demonstrates the relations of the several parts of his figure, he does not consider that the visible figure presented to his eye is only the representative of a tangible figure upon which all his attention is fixed. He does not consider that these two figures have really different properties, and what he demonstrates to be true of the one is not true of the other. It sounds a little bit 
confusing maybe, but he, what he's basically saying is, hey, the geometry of visibles is spherical and the geometry of tangibles parts is, is, is uh, Euclidean and that these two things are absolutely different. So that if somebody tries to confuse us by showing us angles using Euclidean plane geometry, but he's talking about some observation, then he's actually not telling us the correct thing because what he's demonstrating is not true in spherical geometry. Wow, this was a long time ago, huh? 1750, you said? Yep, yep. 1750. Yeah, I want to read this book. Well, you got to read it, Zach. You know, I mean, the, the man, it, it doesn't know how to confuse you. It's very, it's very simply written. It, Actually, Gavin, I've, Gavin, I've had a couple of goes at going through and reading it and discussing, but we, we keep getting dragged back to our lived life situations <laughs> and we haven't finished it yet, but we intend to get around to it, don't we, Gavin? Absolutely, yeah. I think Good. everybody should read that book. It should be compulsory education, yeah. if you ask me. And, and I, I don't say that lightly, because no. compulsory is always a bad thing. <laughs> but in this case, I'll make a fucking exception. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've always kind of said, this is the only diagram you will need to know, and it's the one that's in the, the document, where um, here's the eye, I've made it, whatever one no two units up and there's six units to this whole figure here so this could be six foot for example in which case one unit is three feet if you want to think about it like that and the eyes here so this is a guy that you know is standing there and this is his eye height and this line here is the eye line so for me this is the the, the directly staring out if you're standing absolutely normal looking forward and you haven't got a bend or a click in your head, you know, you're, you're a normal person, you're looking ahead, then your eye line is going to be this blue line straight out ahead of you. And then I've kind of drawn these objects so that we can talk about lampposts, we can talk about things moving away, we can talk about railway lines, um, you know, the, the two red things could be two parallel railway lines. And this diagram kind of, you know, is, is, available to explain all of these phenomena, why things disappear bottom up and, and everything. So yeah, I always felt that this was the, the one diagram that everybody should, should understand. And then, you know, at least for those people who are not mathematically inclined. Yeah. Oh, I know. I want to show this to so many people. I've, I've been good though. <laughs> Feel free, Zach. That's yeah. perfect, man. This is, I was trying to do that on all my drawings and all my, Everything I was trying to do, I kept doing it like this, though, where the uh, the two would come together, you know, and I was drawing them on angles when all I had to do was flatten it out and add that arc. And yeah, yeah, amazing. Gavin, yeah, I've been having that argument since Why day one. Why did I do that? Gavin, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been having that argument since day one, and I still, I still, I, I've come, I was just saying to him the other day that I've come around to realizing that it definitely is the other way is the better way of looking at it. But I'm still, I'm, there's something still egging me back to, to yeah, still no. figure out what's going back the other direction too. <laughs> yeah, and yeah that, kind of, that kind of falls yeah. with like the capuscular rays, anti-capuscular and yeah. capuscular rays kind of works this exact same concept. Yeah. Well, yeah, if yeah. you take that arc and if you were to straighten it out, then all the lines would converge on the in the center there on that eye line radial. Yep. Yeah. So it's wow. Yeah. That's all they did. They just oh, I can't believe. It. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I, we we've been wanting to throw this out for a long time too. But I actually wanted to absolutely make sure that no academic can can get against this. Right. That's mm -hmm. why I was trying to be very careful about making sure that all the argumentation, the mathematical proof, right? That nobody can jump in this after and say, ah, it's a bunch of flat earthers who, who think they've got the answer with the Dunning-Kruger effect, you know? Um, and that, that, that's why me and Glenn have been kind of working on it for, for at least a year. Huh? Is it? Yeah. it? must be at least Glenn, right? Well, right. at least a year. I reckon it's coming up the close to two. Is it the fuck? Oh, Jesus. 
<laughs> yeah, it took me about six months of looking into Angular Resolution before I made my first video because I wanted to make sure I knew, you know, when I told people, you know, at this far away, your eye is going to, at the horizon line, you know, at your eye height, you're going to be missing this many feet. It's just our eyes can't, can't see it. It's just not there. Our eyes can't resolve that thing that far away. Yep. And it made so much sense to me, but I wanted to make sure. I wanted to make sure that what I was reading was accurate. And yeah, because you never know. With the way this was all set up, I'm sure there's plenty of rabbit holes to go down that lead you to making you look like a fool. Yep. Yeah, and, and I know they can if, if you know, they're good at it, right? I mean, I've, I've experienced it firsthand as well. <laughs> so it was important for me to make sure that, you know, there are no holes in the argument, even, you know, because I'm infallible. I'm not infallible either, right? And I, I really just don't want to make any mistakes because I know they'll pounce on it and, and would try and ridiculous. Yeah, so I think we talked briefly about this diagram the last time. I don't know if we want to go through it just to, you know, to recap. Yeah, this um, is the one I was, yeah, I've, I've been looking at this in my head all week. And when it, um, the line on the bottom, the red line on the bottom, if it just undulated a little bit with even straight lines, just straight, that little triangles that pop up and then go back down, it would show that, um, that same thing I caught in those pictures. That once the yeah. angle is so perfect with the ground, from your eye you just can't see it anymore it's unresolvable and it's one of those things that everybody can go out and do you know on any road almost yep yeah i think we do need practical examples and practical experiments and observations that everybody can then confirm this stuff for themselves i don't want to you know people shouldn't just believe me i want this kind of mathematical foundation and then experiments on top so that everybody can say yep you know, I understand what the fuck's going on and I can go and prove it to myself and that's it, game over. As you said earlier, Zach, like, you know, that should be, you know, hopefully game over. This in itself, that diagram in itself, straight away puts pay to their ships over the horizon proof. I mean, even, I mean, even if, I mean, what am I trying to say? Even if this, this worked out to be physically wrong and that we did live on a globe, it still doesn't mean that, that what they put forward is proof because this is an, another totally plausible and from my point of view, way more plausible explanation for that phenomenon. Well, yeah, this is scientific. You know, this yeah. is actually, you can, you can test it going to the beach and testing it, I mean, it would change on, depending on what the weather was like. If you Definitely. were just using your human eye. Yeah, the, that's another thing that I try to bang home so much is that weather is going to change the amount of things cut off at the bottom. People tell yep. me, oh, that's crazy, that's crazy. How could it affect it? And it goes all back into the angular resolution limit. The more things in the way, the the larger that angle is going to get. Yeah. And I think what, what Glenn was trying to say there, or, um, or what, what he did say, just to, to recap, was that, you know, they, they have an explanation for why things disappear, why the ship disappears bottom up, and they say it's the globe. But this is a perfectly good explanation and has nothing to do with the fact that we're on a globe. We're on a flat plane and this works. So if yeah. there's two explanations for the same thing, yeah, and they're equally giving the equal results, then theirs can't be right. Theirs cannot be definitely right if there's a, if, if there's a, a counter explanation, yeah? Exactly. Yeah, it's not a fact if you have another explanation for it. Exactly. Yeah, because I'm not saying, I'm not now saying, this doesn't prove the, the, the flatness of the earth, right? What we're talking about here is how our visual perception works. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're not proving that it's level in that, you know, in a, in a real mathematical sense, yeah? We're just saying that, hey, now we've got an extra explanation. We have the mathematics to prove it. It's obviously something to do with your eye, which everybody can experience. So your explanation is apparently being the only one 
that explains the phenomena is wrong. Yeah. And that I think is, you know, the important part where we need to, or we need to stick to. Yeah, absolutely. That it, it is possible on a flat plane to see all these things that we see. That's where and, I think a lot good, of people don't. And get. the good thing is, it, sorry, the good thing is it wouldn't happen if, if I was on a spherical surface and I agree that I have spherical vision, then you can't have double spherical geometry and have the results. You either have to have, planar vision on a sphere or you have to have spherical vision on a plane yeah you can't have planar and planar would not give you the results spherical and spherical wouldn't give you the results it has to be one or the other right yep wow we need a facility i think there's one i bet 500 yards would do it i bet you could figure some but it's a uh they study waves. I think it's in Sweden, maybe Norway, but they study waves and the, uh, how waves work, but it's a mm -hmm. 500 yard long pool with mm -hmm. that's totally controlled. If you could control the air in there to all be, you know, pretty much the exact same nitrogen, oxygen based atmosphere, you could do some, you could prove this without a doubt, you know, empirically to where no, they could not, Oh man, I'm good. I think you could just about do it on a basketball court. Probably, but I think the further you have, the longer you have, the the more visual you could show people. Because I did it on that one floor; it was like 400 feet, and I showed how the bottom of things were getting cut off on a flat surface at just 400 feet away. And then yeah. I'd raise up my elevation and I could see everything again. Yeah. That's what got me on all this, the whole trying the, to figure the, out the, what, what I used to call, or Gavin, I used to call the wall of water. Yeah. yeah. The wall of water, <laughs> yeah. It's plain in that one. But, I, I, you know, tell, tell me if I'm wrong, guys, but th this diagram, let me just run through it in five minutes, the, the important points, and please tell me if you think everybody can get it, yeah? Um, so it, 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 this is a, if you like, a mixture of tangible geometry because I'm showing three lampposts, let's say, or four lampposts going on a line, right? They're all the same height and I'm looking at a cross-sectional view of it and I would see them all the same height. If I step back far enough away, I know these lampposts are all the same height. That's exactly what I would see, right? Yep. The, the tangible, th these objects. Um, and I've, I've, got, I've put the, now our circle of measure in here, so our arc, so that we can see what actually happens. Now, as the top of the lamppost, or I move to the second lamppost, then the position of that second lamppost is going to fall down on the arc from N to O. So it's going to drop in its visual, visible position. And when I say visible position, I do mean that. I don't mean it's tangible position. It's tangible position isn't moving. It's fucking nailed into the ground, right? It's not going anywhere. Okay. Yeah. It's, its visible position is dropping in my field of view the further away the top of that lamppost goes so that I go from N to O, from O to P, and from P to Q. And basically, if I continued, then that's going to drop all the way down to this blue line, i.e. my horizon, yeah? And the ground is going to do the same thing. The bottom of the lamppost is going to start rising to the horizon. It's gonna, the ground rises to the horizon and the sky falls, right? We're all agreed on that. <clears throat> and the very fact that I am now closer to the bottom of the lamppost than I am to the top of the lamppost, if I was exactly in the middle here, if I was at three units in the middle between zero and six, then both of these things would converge at the same time. And yep. the thing would shrink and shrink and smaller with the same at the top and the same at the bottom, it would shrink and shrink and get there. But yep. that only happens if I am in the middle, equidistant between the top and the bottom. If I am not equidistant from the top and the bottom, then other phenomena occur, which is what I've tried to describe in that document. It's not the same. This, this, simple, this simplistic way of looking at perspective that things get smaller in the distance and the, the, it does so proportionally above and below is only true if you're equidistant from the top and the bottom. 
that's in that's actually mentioned by Rowbottom in his in original book. It is, yeah. He explains it as well with, with straight lines. He doesn't use the arc, which you know I think. No, no he doesn't use the arc, but he, he explains the that um, if they're equidistant, they'll disappear at the same time. They'll, they'll converge at the eye line at the same time. So if, if I'm just looking at this red line, if I imagine I could see a red line, a roof, and I have a floor, then the roof and the floor are going to converge to my eye line or yep. to my horizon, if you like, if we want to call it that too. Which and is why boats disappear bottom up because they convert the, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if the sails and everything are higher above your eye line than the hull is, then that bottom section is going to disappear, reach the eye line before the sails. Yeah, well, actually, it won't reach the eye line. They're going to both reach the eye line at the same, at the same time. But what will happen is you will reach the limits of vision and you will reach the limits of angular diffraction at the bottom quicker. Yeah. Well, no, they still converge at different times too, don't they? That's what you were just saying. Yeah, but exactly where they converge, they converge at infinity, right? Mathematically spoken, they both converge at infinity. But these, the one at the bottom will reach the limits of vision and the limits of angular diffraction quicker. I gotcha. That's, that, I think it's an important distinction to me because I don't believe in infinity anyway. I, I rather, I, I'd rather see indefinite. So yeah. you have a finite length and you have an indefinite length. I hate that word infinity because it's just a mathematical trickery. Is that sort of why you can't draw this diagram to its full extent? Yes. Because that mm -hmm. convergence point is just too far in the distance, too far to the right. Yep. Yeah, you would have to be so far away to take it all in in one view that you wouldn't be able to distinguish it anymore. Yeah. If you like. So again, we're, we're kind of, we're, we reach our limits. But just to go through the argumentation, so when you look at the horizontal spacing between two things, then if I go from H to A, then the horizontal spacing is moving from U to T. And when I go from here, from A to C, it's going from T to S. And when I go from C to F, it's then going from S to R. Those are the four points that I have there. And this angle here between S and R, if you can imagine that this angle here, the difference between these two points is going to be, when I go further away, so small as to be insensible. And that's when the limits of vision are reached. And when that happens, and it's probably due to the fact that we only have a certain amount of rods and cones on the back of our retina, that we can make that differentiation. But basically that angle is so small that we cannot longer differentiate between these two points you know, from our eye limitation. And that's when this whole horizontal space disappears from view. And anything sitting in that horizontal space also disappears from view because you can't tell one point from another. And if you go even further to the right, then the same principle kicks in with, with angular diffraction, the Rayleigh criteria which basically says that two light points can't be distinguished from each other. So you have the vision limits of the eye, and at some point you have the visual limits of nature. Um, and when that happens, those points are no longer distinguishable. Anything in this interval is then lost to sight because it's no longer distinguishable. You cannot see it anymore. And you can see from the top half that the angle's still a lot bigger, right? So this angle has not reached that limit the same way the bottom part has reached the limit. The bottom is always going to reach that limit sooner because you're closer to the ground or closer to the bottom of the object in this case. And why the sun looks like it sets. Yep. And why you, the gaps between, um, what do they call on the railway lines? Mm -hmm. the, yep, the railway lines, yep. The gaps Converge. between the, what are they called? Um, the tracks, railway tracks, right? No, not the tracks, the things that the tracks are on. The, the ties, a railway tie. Yeah, yeah, the, why you can't, 
you can't, like when you're close, you can see the spaces between them. You can see the ballast, the stones between them. And as they get further away, you get to the yeah. point where you can no longer see the ballast. Yep. And one, this one thing about the railway tracks that I think is important as well, that um, I'm, just going, I'm just drawing a sphere here very quickly. So I know you all know what a sphere looks like, but a, a visual aid does help. Um, you can see that at the North Pole, these two lines converge, and at the so-called South Pole, they also converge, right? Mm -hmm. yep. In spherical geometry, these two lines are supposed to be parallel to each other and they converge, right? That's in the definition of the spherical geometry. Yep. Now, if I'm on a railway track and I look forward, then I will see the railway tracks converge to a point. And this is the important part. If I now turn 180 degrees and look the other way down the railway track, they're also going to converge to a point. <laughs> yeah, they don't go spread out together. <laughs> they don't spread out, right? So basically what I'm saying is that that's also a very clear indication that it's spherical geometry we're working with, because only spherical geometry can do that. Converge in front of you and converge behind of you like the North Pole and the South Pole do. So your vision, that, that's another example of, you know, or a, I'm not saying it's a proof, it's an observational experience that shows you that these axioms of visual geometry are spherical and that they are self-evident and that you can observe and experience them yourself. Well, it's, it's an evidence, I reckon it is a proof, it's an evidence that your vision is spherical. For me, because it is too. Those, because you do know those lines are parallel. Yes, I could walk down that railway track and I know they're not getting smaller. And the yeah. further I go, they're still going to converge. Yep. So it, it's... In that respect, it's just like spherical geometry is, yeah? Excellent explanation. Just had a good aha moment there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> uh, let me just skip through this document because uh, I think this basically takes us through the document of the theorems that we, you know, that are in that document, but I'm pretty sure I had some examples, yeah, to try and make this a little bit more how should I say, easier for people to, so, you know, explaining why lampposts, I've put, just put lampposts in there and, you know, I've tried to explain it a little bit more. It can be the same thing as a railway, you know, what I just talked about, yeah? Yep. Um, it's the same reason buildings disappear from the bottom up, same principle, um, or the sunset, yeah? Um, or a brick wall, you know? If you look at a brick wall or a I corridor. Was, now, if I was thinking, if, if you had a long corridor like that and you put your head up against one wall all the way to one side and something down at the far end against the same wall, wouldn't that one side of it that's near the wall be cut off? Like, like this picture here? Yeah. Bit like, like this one? Like you will, you will not see the pictures on the wall. These pictures that you have on the wall, you will lose sight of them quicker if you're closer to this side than you would of the pictures on the other side of the wall. Yeah. yeah. That's what you mean, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. You have them for everything, yeah, great. This, wow. And um, I actually did a whole modeling of, of how a corridor looks so that you know, I can move the corridor wall backwards and forwards and show what's actually happening on the eye. And I hope you guys can see this a little bit because this is where you can see that if, if you can now think of this as the eye or you can think of it as your geometrical visual space, it doesn't really matter. Um, I th thinking of it as the eye is maybe easier for, for most people and not that abstract geometrical thing, but basically as this, wall moves further away from you and when I say wall I'm basically taking a snapshot of a corridor let's say here at where these two doors are and I'm taking another snapshot further down the corridor and another snapshot another snapshot this is what this plane represents here and if I move that away then what's happening on the eye this red um, what looks like a rectangle is going to look more and more like a Euclidean rectangle. You will not be able to see that it's actually curved. 
you can see because this is fairly close to you that there is still a little curve on these lines, right? Yeah, like and the example it, you showed of putting something close to your eye and it looks spherical and then... That's right. So if I was to move this very close to my eye, then this rectangle will blow up and fill basically all of my eye here and it will be very obviously spherical. But as soon as things get further away from you, then there is hardly any difference between you seeing it Euclidean and it being Euclidean. You will not be able to tell the difference, at least not from your, you know, your eyesight. And that's, you know, when I said, when, when I say it's spherical and people say, but Gavin, I don't see a curve, then th that's what I was trying to explain. You don't see the curve because it's a very good approximation to the Euclidean world at normal distances of sight. And especially far away, you can't tell the difference. You can only tell the difference when it's really up close. Yeah, really up close. That, I well, couldn't believe go, how much it curves. If you go back a bit, Gav. Yep. You can see there's, there you have that, that diagram in the bottom right compared yep. to the one in the bottom left. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that Much is it. Curve. You can see it's curved so that the plane's right up against to the eye and you can see that what's being left on the eye, the material impression on the retina is actually curved. Yeah. And it's only then that you could really see it. So I'm here only two, 1.5 away from the guy and here I'm, um, yeah. yeah. At 4.3, yeah. It's good to see this one. I've been lucky enough to see this one in animation. When I can do that right now. Hold on. I'll just open it up. So you can see I basically modeled a corridor here with, with roofs and stuff like that, you know. Um, I modeled a sphere for the eye. I modeled the horizon, the, um, the azimuthal, or the, the uh, what, what, what do we call them, the... Uh, longitude circles and latitude circles. Um, I made various lines um, and walls and planes and spheres. So, but basically, if I zoom out a little bit, hopefully you guys can see the overall picture. Yeah. So I can I can now move this this closer to the eye. Uh -huh. And if I if I now zoom in a little bit more, then you guys can see that the thing is curved if i turn it oh, around yeah. a bit yeah then that's yeah. the picture i was basically showing yeah and if i zoom out a little bit more again oops and move the wall or the placing plane away down the corridor and now zoom into this part then you can see that it's you know indistinguishable from a rectangle now. Yeah. Yeah. They look parallel. And I've modeled you know all these different things as arc arc measures, right? And and you can see the angle here in the middle of the sphere is that solid angle I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So you know I can basically show what these angles are, and and all the different parts. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the main thing here was that I basically, hold on, if I, if I can get rid of a few of these things and I can show you guys in a little bit more detail. Or maybe I'll prepare the next time we come on and, and we can go through the, the build up of, of how I built the eye or how I built the geometry of visual space. I basically just built it with three equatorial circles. So this one, the green one, there's a blue one going like that and there's a red one going like that. Um, and I basically call them, let me just stop this share. I call them, I call them the horizon circle. So the circle that goes around, you know, this idea of, of a hula hoop around, around me. I call it this one, which is the one, the big circle that goes over my head. And that's the thing that tells me what is straight ahead. And the other one is what I call the facing circle. So the one that is if you like, if I face something, then I have that. If you like, if you, if you imagine there's a circle drawn, oh, there is a circle drawn on there. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's my facing circle. This is my horizontal circle. And this is my, you know, circle. So, so the eye is made up, if you like, of these three great circles that I've drawn on a sphere. And when I look at something and I, and I elevate things, 
then then I can use the the angles between these three great circles to to make those measurements and show these arc arc segments. Wonderful. They, That's they look like they were originally based on the Cartesian. How long did that take you to do that? Oh, I got into the swing of things one day, and I, I, I think it was like more or less in one day. I just got up in the morning, and I thought, you're going to fucking finish this. <laughs> so, but I had been playing with GeoGebra for quite a while, so I've got quite a whole bunch of GeoGebra stuff that, you know, I think is – it's a pretty cool program for yeah, mathematicians just to, you know. It's like experimenting almost, pretty much. Mathematical yep. experimentation. I did my yeah. first copy of a GAV diagram just the day, before, the day before. Yesterday, I think. So, sorry about that. I was up late. <laughs> Me too. No problem. Yeah, so the, I mean, the other thing would be, I don't know if you guys want to still go through that document and understand some of the subtleties of it, but, you know, or read it in your own good time and come back with questions. You know, I, I think for me, it's important everybody gets the overall picture of, you know, of the high level overview. And what's in that document is very particular things about depending on where the eye is relative to certain things, what we can and what we cannot see. And I just wanted to prove it all geometrically as well so that there would be no comeback and, you know, there's no idiots saying, you know, ah, oh, there's a mistake in here, the whole thing's wrong, right? Um, so that's where I really wanted to be, how should I say, very grounded or fundamental in my approach, so to speak. Yeah, I haven't found any yet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over it again a couple more times. I've been reading it at work on, um, on breaks. Yep. It's my new break time thing. I'll go out there and I'll start. And I, I've started it over about three times now. Because whenever I start going through it, I'll get to a certain point, and then it's like, well, I need to go back. And But uh, I've read it twice now at home. And it's... Yep. I haven't found anything wrong yet. No, it seems so, pretty right to me. I actually um, was just telling Gav, I went in and got into GeoGebra because there was a couple of things I wanted to prove myself. And I did prove them to myself. They were... You know, they weren't intuitive. That's why I put that little post in yesterday, Gav, where you yep. said that it's, some are occulted, so, some of it's intuitive, some of it's not. Yep. But, uh, now, there's, there's some subtleties in there that are, are again, you know, very much, and I, I, maybe just to explain that once more. So I, I think that perspective is, for me, the mathematical rules where I can take a 3D object and apply mathematical rules to show a representation on a plane, yep. usually with a window of perspective, you know, the, the veil, the window that they use, the old perspective painters, yeah? Great yep. the way that word window co crops up in all our computing language nowadays. <laughs> yeah? um, and the very, I think there's a, there's a distinction to be made between that and what I would call the theory of natural perspective, which where I'm talking more about geometrical optics, how the eye works, and that there has to be, you know, a distinction between these two, which they really like to fudge nowadays, right? You know, they'll, they'll talk about lenses and other, you know, they'll show you these optical experiments where they, where they show you a little candle there and they point and you put some rules to, to show it inverted. So they, they talk about, those things in a very simplistic manner and perspective is also simplified down to yeah kind of you know general things that everybody should know oh yeah double the distance half the size not true not, not, not right. fucking true right yeah. um, and there, there's a very you have to distinguish between how vision works and and how perspective goes you know i think that's immensely important if you had if you had a a, a building I don't think what the I don't think the different distance would make any difference. But if you were on the um, the thirty fourth floor of a building and that floor was exactly a thousand feet above sea level, and you had another building a hundred miles away, or within yeah well even a hundred miles away that was still the same floor 
was at the same level, same distance above sea level, they would still be on your eye line. That, that line would not change altitude. The only things oh, yeah. that would change are the distances of things below and above, depending on, you know, like if you had 30 floors below and 70 floors above on both buildings, you'd see things converge at different rates. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great experiment. There's another thing here that might be quite interesting for you guys. When does a circle is appear as a circle? Which I always, uh, I don't know if you've heard the Glober argument that if you're looking at a clock on the wall, right? And you go to one side of the clock, then the clock will appear to be an ellipse. Um, and Globers will always say, it can't work in a flat plane. You know, if the, if this, if the sun is a circle and it's going round, then it should change its shape, right? Right. Yeah. And, you know, intuitively, yeah, they're kind of correct, right? You know, you can look at a circle on a wall, and if I move to the side of it, then it will look elliptical. But there's, there's actually a few things that, again, very subtle in there. Um, and I found an old English translation of Euclid's optics. So Euclid did not only just do the elements of geometry, Euclidean plane geometry, he also wrote a pamphlet about optics. And the very first English translation ever made was in 1950. You've got to believe that, right? I mean, it's, it's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. And in, in this translation of Euclid Optics into English, um, he's got some theorems in there that, appear, that, that describe how a circle appears. So I went through this paper. This is the original proof from Euclid, right, um, in blue. And I then basically remodeled them in GeoGebra. So let me just go down to it here. And basically what he's saying is that if you've got a circle here, I'm just drawing the circle now on the ground, and I'm directly above the circle, directly above the center of the circle, sorry, at any altitude, then when I look down at that circle, it always is going to appear to be a circle. It'll get smaller, but the higher I go, or the lower I come down, it's always going to be a circle. The reason for that is that the angle subtended at this point, the angle subtended at the eye, if that's where my eye is, is always going to be equidistant to any of these two side points or any of these two points. So any diameter will appear to be the same ratio. And if two diameters are the same, then it must be a circle. If two diameters are not the same, then it's an ellipse. Right? So that one is, is very clear that if I am straight over the center of a circle, or I'm facing, maybe a circle is drawn in a wall and my eye is directly opposite the center, then I can move back or move forward. It's always going to look like a circle to me. Agreed? Agreed. Yep. But there's also another one where everything will look as a circle to me. Again, this is the Euclidean original proof, right? And I modeled it in, in GeoGebra again. And basically, it's the special case where this radius of the circle, so this from E to B, the distance you are away is the same as the radius. So in the first one, it didn't matter how far I went away from the circle, it would always appear as a circle, just get smaller or bigger. And in this case, it's that I am ex exactly at that position away from, the away from the circle that is also the radius of the circle. It's a, a special case, right? And if that's the case, then basically using Thales' theorem, you know that that is always going to be a 90 degree angle. It doesn't matter where you are. And basically what it means is that if you are anywhere on a sphere, that is the same radius as the circle you're looking at. So the circle I'm looking at is this green one. I, the eye is on the surface of a sphere. It doesn't matter where I go in this sphere, this thing is always going to appear as a circle to me. Wow, yeah. So <laughs> why, why does the sun always appear to be a circle? 
because of the. And we're back to the spherical geometry and the way the eye geometry works. of the eye. Wow. Yeah, because with our limit of how far we can see and everything like that, it's it's not like we're seeing it, you know, shrink away and go off into the distance. You have to be there. Has to be special circumstances. You have to be high up on a mountain where you're. Yep. You're elevated and not so close to the ground. So this makes so much sense. So it's always pretty much about the same distance away from us. Yeah. The way we're the way we're seeing it. The way we are seeing it is basically all the same way. And if if we agree that the circle diameter of the sun, if this is the sun I'm looking at, right? The green one, and it's 32 miles. Then it means that it's 16 miles is the radius basically of the sphere. And if I'm anywhere on that sphere, then that will always appear to be a circle because the distance from here to here or the distance from there to there is always going to be the same. And the way that you know something is a circle is if two diameters are of equal proportion in a one-to-one -one relationship. That condition where a circle always appears as a circle. And that's when the enclosing angles are the same. And basically, this is Euclid again. I've just modernized it, so it's not coming from me. But what this guy was saying, that the enclosing angles, as long as they're the same, then it also looks like a circle. So here it is. If that's where my eye is, and I'm looking at this circle on the ground, but you could just transpose the whole thing, right? I could be on the ground, and the circle could be in the sky. Mm -hmm. So, you know, geometrically, it doesn't matter then this thing will look like a circle when the enclosing angles next to each other are equal. So it doesn't have to be directly above. That was case number one. It doesn't have to be on a sphere. That was case number two. There is also the case, the special case, where when the enclosing angles are the same, it will also look, look like a circle as well. So I was just trying to, to find out what the hell does that mean? You know, why do why is it that we we see a circle as a circle? Um, and there's again, there's a lot of information in here that I don't think I should go into right now. No, it looks like a fascinating read, though. It is. Yep, I'll send it to you guys too. So, when did he write this? How old is Euclid? So Euclid must have been. I mean, they reckon it's what 1500 to 2000 years ago. Wow. And the only translation, and, and it says on the actual translation that this is the very first one. The very first English translation of Euclid Optics was in 1950. I, I could hardly believe it when I heard it. Why? Yeah, like, why? why? They're hiding something for... I mean, I don't do Latin and I don't do fucking Greek, so, you know, why? And I don't do Arabic. You know, these are the three <laughs> other languages, right? And nobody bothered to translate it into English until 1950? Yeah, talk about trying to hide something and keep it under wraps. There's no doubt in my mind that's what's going on. Yeah, mine neither. Yeah, all this should be taught to you when you're in school. One of the arguments that they always have is that they say that Polaris, you know, a sighting of Polaris, whatever degrees Polaris is sighted at, is, is proof that we're on a sphere because on a flat plane, it apparently wouldn't work. So the globe argument is that the light rays come from Polaris. We are all on a globe. And if anybody takes a sighting, then it will correspond exactly to your latitude on a, on a sphere, yeah? You've heard that argument, right? Yeah, oh yeah. And the, the, the proof that it doesn't work on a flat plane is this one where they say it would only work at two specific points, namely if you're directly below Polaris or you're at 45 degrees, everything else wouldn't work. It would all be wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, but if you, if you look at it basically from another point of view, um, namely this one. So this is the whole thing that I modeled then in GeoGebra, which is basically again showing their argument first. So this one's kind of showing, there's my latitude at 45 degrees. I'm on that circle of latitude and I'm observing Polaris, then it would be a 45 degree angle. Um, 
that would be correct for basically any latitude. I've given two examples here of 52 and 18. But the other way to look at it is, um, is that um, if, I do a, if I do an orthographic projection of that latitude down onto a flat planar equatorial circle here, then that's that blue line here mm -hmm. in, the, in the middle. Um, and uh, if, if, if Polaris, um, the more I, if this is, if zero is the North Pole, if, if we take, if you like, similar to the azimuthal, so that latitude is actually the distance from the center and longitude remains the, you know, the direction around the circle, then it actually works out to be exactly the same, that the further I go from the center point, we know that Polaris drops visibly in in the sky yeah mm -hmm. um so that if you basically think of latitude and longitude as being the distance outwards from a north pole center rather than circles on a sphere then it's absolutely perfect um basically our perspective vision is the answer why why it works you remember this glenn the glasses <laughs> This is a, a picture of, you know, just something very close to me and I was just playing with uh, the various things. So I'm stood basically here on this white line um, and I'm, I took a picture of, of, yeah, what I saw or what the camera saw. <clears throat> and then I was just looking, you know, to, to demonstrate what, what we mean when we say we don't attend to visible figure, right? So if I take away this, take away this image, then all the visible figures of the things that we are seeing are actually like that and not, you know, when we look at the object or we look at the scene uh, like this, then we don't notice all these things, right? No, because we know that they're all the same size and they're, yeah. we, we apply it in our brain that they're like that. We don't see it like this. It's exactly. Like what we actually Jeff do see it like that. We just don't attend to it. Yeah, we don't attend to it. That's what I meant. <laughs> it's the attending to that doesn't occur. We 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 don't occur. We don't attend to that. Well, that is that, that is there the tangible view. Take the photo away, and you've got the visible view. That's so the visible. That's the visible world. And it, and, and, it's and it's, I think that's. I think that's the point to make there, Gab, is that that's that that there are those two worlds. Yep. That that the, that the visible world is a world of of itself. Yes. But it's it's obviously related to the physical world. Yeah. I mean, it, it they can't be there if the physical world wasn't there, no. and there wasn't an eye to see it. Um, and I like this diagram because it demonstrates quite a lot of the things. So if you start to look at the shadows here between, between lines or the sizes of these lines, then you can see, for example, just to take one example, th these slats here are all equally spaced and they're all the same size. So this guy who built this fence made probably one section like this. He nailed the slats down and then he had a template and he copied it and he copied it. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, I don't know, eight, ten sections until you reach this tree up here. Now, that means that the spacing of all these things is the same. And I mean, I've looked at it. I mean, it's accurate at least to, you know, a couple of millimeters. You know, I'm not saying the guy did it, you know, um, industrial strength, but it's a fairly, a fairly accurate fence, right? You know? Um, built using, you know, typical Euclidean planar tools. He will, he will have had a level and a ruler and various things like that, right? So he probably would have used a jig. Okay, yeah, point taken. <laughs> um, the main thing here, though, that if you see, for example, the shadow that this slat is leaving on the ground, then the length of this shadow is obviously getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And the point that I was making about the horizontal spacing, so between this shadow and this shadow um, is getting less and less and less and less and less and less. And back here, I can no longer see the horizontal spacing 
between the slats, yeah? So if there was a little bird sitting between those slats here and a little bird sitting between the slats down there, I'd be able to see this bird, but I wouldn't be able to see the bird down there because anything between that horizontal spacing will be lost to sight. Yeah, this is a great picture. This is fabulous, the way you put it all together like that. People, everybody needs to see this. Yep, so th this would be a, a typical diagram that anybody, I mean, that's the beautiful thing about this, you know, you can go out into nature <laughs> and just take a picture of a fence or a barn or any scene and you can basically prove to yourself what I'm saying in that document that as things get, you know, further away, the horizontal spacing, you reach the limits, parallel lines converge, stuff in between can't be seen. If I was to drop my eye down to the to the level of the ground, so if I put my camera at the level of the ground, then we would again have noticed these things disappearing bottom up. What you suggested, Zach, that you know we do these kind of experiments, but basically anybody can do them in the quiet of their own, you know, their own home, so to speak. Yeah, to prove to themselves that what I've written in that document is correct. At least I hope so. Yeah. Yeah, I think you are. I mean, it's not, I don't know, it's really not up one of those things. It's not for debate. You're just stating obvious things that anybody can go out and see empirically. We can all yeah, go out the, and see the, the, the cyclist written. The, the sophist will definitely try to debate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's like you said, when you when you get your mindset into actually differentiating those two worlds and then looking at them both at the same time yep but with that mindset it helps so much it makes it makes it so much clearer yeah yeah so it's just to try and put it all onto one one big the top kind of explains you know the physical world and we're looking at it and natural observations the second one shows this visible figure and extension that we talked about. That's the way we see things. Parallel lines meet at two points. Every right line is an axiom of a greater circle. You know, circles always appear as circles if you're at the center of a sphere. And if you look at a circle, it's always a circle. It never changes to an ellipse. Um, and then on the right-hand side, the, the deception, if you like, that they're always telling us it's planar representations is all we get. So they, they miss out the middle bit the middle bit, if you like, the signs are the things that they don't want to tell you about. And they basically go from the left-hand side to the right-hand side um, and skip the bit in the middle. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's also a, something called astral geometry, which is um, um, where planar and cylindrical geometry um, have their commonality with spherical geometry because all of them are basically 2D planar. Obviously cylindrical has an altitude, but the planar part and the spherical part, so the, the bottom of a cylinder is basically the latitude and the longitude. Um, instead of it being on a sphere, you can do it on a plane, as Glenn quite correctly pointed out earlier on, he is further out than we are, and I'm in the middle, and you guys are probably closer to the center, right? Yep. Um, and that's actually also a definition of latitude. It doesn't have to be a latitude circle and a sphere. And that's where spherical and planar geometry, you know, have their um, um, commonalities because to make it spherical is just this mathematical trick of, of curving the surface into a space that you're not allowed to think about. <laughs> um, and, that's, and that's exactly how they transferred the their so-called spherical ball in geodetic surveying. They've wrapped the cylinder around it and put all their information onto that and then roll it out onto their state plane coordinate system. Yep, yep, that sounds exactly right. Because uh, remember I told you that's also cylindrical coordinates is what air traffic controllers <laughs> use. So each air traffic control tower is in the center of a cylinder and that's the space that they control. And they look at the world as, you know, being um, going outwards from their um, point in the middle of the cylinder. 
and then the altitude of the plane is the column above. And basically a plane jumps from one cylinder to another in the control of each of these air traffic controllers when they're moving you know, across the earth. So the whole of air traffic control is done using cylindrical coordinates. Again, you know, another pointer to how the whole thing, you know, fits together. Yeah. We have been convinced that we live on a spherical world which we see through Euclidean eyes. But the truth is we live in a Euclidean world which we see through spherical eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs>